What's up guys? Welcome to the Blitzkrieg Pop Supplemental, Stardate 311921.8. I'm your host, Adam, co-owner of Infinite Collectibles in Paducah, Kentucky, a little comic book shop. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to our patrons for making this show plausible. Uh, the room looks like shit though because I'm still working on putting up all the acoustic foam you guys bought for us. New microphones, new studio. Right on, you guys are the best. Uh, if you'd like to follow our show, check us out at facebook.com slash infinite paducah. That's our store. Our show is at facebook.com slash that's a butt. And you too can become a patron at patreon.com slash blitzpop. I am sitting in studio today with my good friend, Cosmic Connection. This is a pretty rad beer. Um, I checked it out because Cosmic Connection ties into what I'm doing today. And I will. So here later, I'll be going through the Eternals. Uh, but this book, this. <laughs> This beer ties right in with that book. I mean, it's cosmic, right? It has a constellation with a hop on it. It's pretty ripping. I don't know what this thing is. It's a sour New England style DIPA. Not really sure what that means, but I'm about to crack it open. Take a sip. Wow. It's not kidding about sour. Oh shit, okay. Anyway, it's been a hell of a week here. Uh, WandaVision was awesome. I loved it. Totally intrigued. Can't wait for more. Don't want to put out any spoilers in case you haven't seen it. I thought it was incredible. Uh, totally in love with the dynamic of the show. It's perfect. Also, got to give a shout out to patron Luby Lassiter for turning me on to this book, First Knife. I'd never heard of it before. It was originally solicited as Protector before the virus happened, and... They changed it because they just, I think they just outright canceled the book. And they changed the title to First Knives a little less generic than Protector. It's by Simon Roy and Daniel Benson. And Simon Roy was one of the co-writers of Prophet. And before you say it, no, I'm not talking about fucking Rob Liefeld's Prophet. Although he did create Prophet, um, I never read that shit. But it's one thing to see Rob's artwork, I cringe. It's like, eeh. If it says he's writing it, I walk the other way. I've never read that crap, never will. However, the Brandon, the Brandon Graham prophet with Simon Roy was amazing. This is a lot like that as far as the universe building goes. It's real dirty, gritty. It's a post-apocalyptic America in the 33rd century. Uh, and there's like, I've only read one issue. Uh, don't want to give too much of it away. It's awesome. It's it, This collects the whole thing. But anyway, there's like... Earth has become tribal in the 33rd century, and the it's just completely destroyed by wars and, you know, viruses and, and what have you. And there's, like, a scene where you see a spacesuit kind of come to life, and it's wearing NATO patches. They have no idea what NATO is. It's very cool. They're almost like space gods, like in orbit around the planet or something. I haven't gotten very far, like I said, but I'm already putting this on my recommend list. It's uh, like I said, it's it's all five issues. It's a complete story. The artwork I thought was gorgeous. I'll give you just a quick look at it. Um, just I really dig this kind of stuff. It kind of reminds me of um, Headlopper, the style of artwork here. Uh, that's by Andrew McLean, and I highly recommend Headlopper as well. It's kind of a sword and sorcery, but this is I mean, this is just incredible. I I'm totally into this. Going to definitely check that out more. All right, so the thing that's got me here is the Eternals. And today I'll be reviewing Eternals number one, volume five from 2021. Actually, it just came out like last week by uh, Kieran Gillen and Esad Rubik. And I hope I'm saying his name right. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So Gillen is known for his creator-owned series, Wicked Plus Divine, which AJ absolutely adores. And for many a Marvel story, honestly, uh, my personal favorite of his is God Hunter, a yarn that follows my all-time favorite character, Beta Ray Bill, and his insane quest to exact vengeance on Galactus for eating the homeworld of his people. I'm not going to spoil it. I just want to say it's one of those stories like uh, a how far is he willing to go kind of thing. Uh, it's amazing. And then there's Rivik, who is no slouch himself, and many of you know him as the co-creator of Gore the God Butcher, uh, which uh, I had the pleasure of talking about here recently, um, and he was the artist for much of Jason Aaron's Thor God of Thunder. He also did 
Silver Surfer Requiem, which Alex and I talked about on uh, episode 25 of the Blitzkrieg Pop. Um, he's done Loki and Submariner The Depths, just to name a few. Both creators are prolific, as you'll soon see. But before I jump into the book, I want to refresh you on the who, the what, and the why of the Eternals in something of a truncated history. In many ways, the origin of the Eternals is the origin of the 616 Earth and all its inhabitants. First appearing in Eternals 1 in 1976 and completely conceived, created, drawn, and written by none other than the legendary Jack Kirby, who, at this time, had just returned to Marvel after a six-year stint at DC where he'd created Darkseid and the New Gods for his Fourth World Saga. With gods and demons still very much on his mind, as well as a certain book by Eric Von Daniken, which is actually mentioned on the cover of issue two of The Eternals, Jack set out to explain where it all came from. Mutants and humans, scrolls, the Kree, everything. The cause? Celestials, immensely powerful beings wielding power beyond imagination, scouring the cosmos in search of life, acting as judge, jury, and if required, executioner. Fail to show evolutionary potential, and you are eradicated, with life on your planet being completely reset, to begin again and maybe the next time, survive. Pass the test, though, and this is where it gets interesting. The Celestials begin to tinker. In the case of 616 Earth, millions of years ago, the Celestials arrived and found proto-humanity. They judged them worthy, and after what must have been the first alien abduction in the Marvel Universe, performed genetic experiments on the beasts ultimately creating three divergent races. The long-lived but not yet immortal Eternals, the genetically unstable monstrous deviants, and you guessed it, humans. It was these experiments performed by the Celestials that would eventually lead to the capacity for superpower mutations in humans. The reason why Bruce Banner didn't die when he was hit with a gamma bomb, it's because of these latent genes that the Celestials actually installed into humanity. Same reason why Spider-Man was able to gain the abilities of an irradiated spider. So myself, I find the Celestials to be incredibly interesting. If you would like to know more about them, I highly recommend The Eternals by Kirby, of course, and The Ultimates 2 from 2016 by Al Ewing and Travel Foreman. Both books give backstory, with the latter being their origin story. It's really cool shit. Back to the Eternals, though. I mentioned they weren't quite immortal yet, but very long-lived nonetheless. Their immortality would come later, after an experiment with cosmic energy by their then-leader Kronos went awry, bathing them all in cosmic energy, activating latent supergenes, and destroying their home Titanos. All in a normal day's work, right? Anyway, now the Eternals found they could channel massive amounts of cosmic energy, with each Eternal gaining control of every molecule in their body. That's some serious fucking control. Also, every Eternal could shoot energy from their eyes, fly, they don't get tired, they're immune to disease, rapidly regenerate, they're near impervious to damage, they have super strength, and most importantly, as long as the machine, a restorative device created by the Celestials, is intact, they cannot die. They can't be killed, but they will return sooner or later. And the machine just so happens to be where our story begins. Icarus, who shares a leadership role with Zerus, along with most of the Eternals, were last seen in Avengers, the final host, by Jason Aaron and Ed Beginnis. When Iron Man and Doctor Strange arrived in Olympia, uh, you know, the mountains of Greece, where the gods live, yeah, that's the Eternals. Anyway, when Stark and Strange arrive, they find all the Eternals except Icarus dead from apparently self-inflicted wounds. Icarus explains to them the Eternals had discovered they'd been living a lie, that the Celestials had not meant for them to protect humanity, as seen in Kirby's run, but instead they were to cultivate humanity, as the Celestials saw humans as antibiotics, basically, to be eaten, uh, to rid them of parasites. This discovery drove the Eternals mad, and they either killed each other or themselves. Icarus himself is last seen succumbing to his wounds. So now we're all up to date here, and I must say, this beer is fucking awesome. I'm not, as I stated before, a big IPA guy, but I really dig this. Maybe it's the DIPA, the DIPA. I'm going to have another one. I'm going to have another sip, that is. 
Anyway, our book begins on Icarus, again thrust into the world of the living, the shock on his face beautifully rendered by Ribic. The computer, or the machine as they call it, is the narrator of this book, and I'm going to read its words for you here. He opens his eyes alive again. He does not remember how many times this has happened. In truth, neither do I. We do what must be done. Icarus, what are the principles? Protect celestials. Protect the machine. Correct excess deviation. At least in this, all is as it should be. He remembers how he died, how all the Eternals died, the shame, the fire, and hands on each other's throats. He feels it, breathes deeply, and lets it go. He aims himself at the task ahead. He flies at the future without fear or regret. He has always been a living arrow. So that's exactly, you know, what I mentioned earlier about the Eternals all having died recently um, in the pages of Jason Aaron's Avengers. Icarus is remembering that here. Now, on page two, we get this beautiful, beautiful rendering of the exclusion by Ribic. It's so awesome looking. It looks strangely technological and just cold. Of course, it is in the polar region. And down here in the right corner, we get the exclusion. Sealed between six artificial molecules secreted beneath the South Pole, which is super cool. I like that. Also, we have the words, he is an eternal. He has always been. So on page three here, um, we see Icarus staggering out of his slumber, uh, cupping his balls, which is what any normal human being would do. Um, and he's talking to the computer, telling him, telling the computer he really doesn't have time to run tests on himself. Uh, the computer remarks that, his personality seems intact, his uh, usual brusqueness within previous readings. Um, and then Icarus states that uh, the computer usually doesn't talk this much. And the computer tells us he's correct, which gives me pause. Something is wrong. Icarus asks, who else is alive? The computer says, the machine, I'm sorry, says, others would use euphemisms like awake instead of alive. But arrows are nothing if not direct. You are the last to die. You are the last to return. Everyone is alive. And we see Icarus flying off. So here we get a two-page spread telling us that the Eternals were created by Jack Kirby. We get a little bit of a... <laughs> it's a very small, but this is a, kind of a catch-up here. It says, A long, long time ago, alien space gods came to Earth. They made 100 Eternals. They made 100 Deviants. They left. Uh, we get the title of the story, Only Death is Eternal, Part 1. And then we get a look at just how many Eternals there are and where they are. Get a good look at that. Uh, we see Icarus over here in Olympia. We see over here in the Hex that all of them are classified. I don't know who that's going to be. And we have a few who are noted as Location Unknown, Aura of the Pandemonium Box, Lewis Three Fingers, All Records Lost. Hmm, interesting. On the next page, we see Icarus, and the machine tells him that Zerus wants to speak with him. Now, we have not seen Zerus yet. Here's Zerus, um, eldest son of Kronos, the Eternal who fucked up his experiment and gave them all powers. He was voted leader of the group, which pissed off his brother Alars, who left Earth and settled on Titan, moon of Saturn, where he fathered the Titanian Eternals and Thanos himself. Zerus, often mispronounced by humans as Zeus, actually killed the she that he's talking about on this page. Um, he's saying, uh, Welcome back, Icarus. The Eternals are of one mind. She is to be freed. You're at the exclusion. Do the honors. The machine tells us one mind is a euphemism. Zerus is saying that he, the eternal political system has reached a decision, and when a decision is made, it is made. All divisions are hidden behind this politeness. Icarus, though, is not one for euphemisms. Whatever happens next is your fault, he tells Zerus. And Zerus says, many things are my fault, Icarus. I am eternal prime. It is my job to have things be my fault. And it is your job to do things. You can feel the animosity between these two. Uh, and you can actually see it on their faces. Icarus is not happy being told to release whoever it is that's in the exclusion. So we see on the next page that... Uh, Icarus is flying towards what looks like a single molecule of ice. I'm going to imagine that's a prison cell. The machine tells us that in a long enough time frame, everyone makes mistakes. The eternal time frame is as long as it gets. Most mistakes are just passing errors. An eternal is mind-wiped and reassumes their position in the machine. 
Sometimes mistakes are big enough to make all agree the eternal itself is a mistake. They are excluded. Excluded you was the first. He thought the best way to fulfill the eternal principles was to scour the earth of anything but eternals. This you, I believe here, is Uranus, who was a brutal eternal who brought war to Titanos and great-granduncle of Thanos. The machine then mentions that across the ages, more have been excluded for unforgivable errors, from apocalyptic auto-deification to siring a creature that killed half the galaxy with a single finger click. Excluded SP's sins are the most recent. SP, as we'll find on the next page, is actually Sprite. She says, hey ya, Icarus. He says, Sprite, they are of one mind. You have been restored to your last safe backup. You're no longer excluded. She says, by the lack of hugging, I'm guessing you're not exactly of one mind with them. He says, you know I'm not a hugger, and what I believe doesn't matter. She says, so you're not going to be a loose cannon who stops me going free? Too late anyway. Okay, so I believe a little bit of backstory is required here. Sprite is unlike most Eternals, and is considered a trickster akin to Loki. Unable to grow, Sprite became tired of being treated as the 11-year-old he seemed to be. In the 2006 Eternal series by Gaiman and Romita Jr., he mind-wiped his fellow Eternals and gave them new lives. When Icarus, who at that time believed he was Ike Harris, was killed, he awoke in the machine and regained his memories. He set out to awaken the others and eventually got to Zerus. Zerus was very upset that Sprite had them memory wiped and killed Sprite, banishing him to the exclusion to prevent his rebirth. And yes, I'm saying him. The gender change is actually addressed later in this story, so we'll just cross that bridge when we get to it. Here we see while Icarus is not over the betrayal, he is willing to follow the leader. That's kind of his thing. Sprite, however, not so much. She's off and Icarus vows that he will stop her. On the next page, we get an explanation of how their traveling works. They use what is called the network. Eternal's suite of abilities includes complete molecular disassembly and reassembly, as in effective teleportation. To do this over a distance is of enormous strain. The machine supplements this ability with the network, forming a system of subdimensional threads interlacing the planet. Any cleared Eternal can disassemble, enter the system, and move between the nodes, then reassemble in the required destination. The machine will argue that the system works incredibly well considering its complexities. Most Eternals would agree, though, likely underline the word considering. It is the teleportation equivalent of a mass transit system in a major Earth city. Unreliable, complicated, yet essential. So here we get a shot of Icarus and Sprite in New York City. Sprite is very glad to be free, and she's saying, Oh wow, would you look at what they've done? This is just wonderful. Icarus <laughs> is not as pleased. He's saying she's celebrating. Of course she is. So here Icarus is explaining exactly what Sprite did and why he's being overbearing. She doesn't remember that she grew bored of her station as Eternal Child and that she almost destroyed the machine in order to free herself from it. After he reminds her of that, Iron Man shows up. Now, if I have any critique of the art so far, it's Iron Man's head here. It just seems a little bit too wide at the jaw. But that's not really, I mean, that's like all I have to say about, about it. Anyway, Tony asks Icarus, if he's going to freak out again, if you remember uh, when last they met, dead Eternals were everywhere and Icarus himself died. The machine clues us in on previous events and Icarus replies, we are feeling much better. The machine says, and I believe these rectangular word balloons are for the reader's sake to add context. I've watched Icarus for a million years. I'm still unsure whether he is very dry, completely clueless or both. For most, if not all of the Eternals' publication history, he has been a sort of generic leader character, you know. I feel like that may change with this series, though. So anyway, I really enjoyed this sequence. Uh, you'll notice as Iron Man lands on the street, passers-by begin pointing at him, getting out phones and taking pictures. It's one of those small details that makes comics so cool to me. Anyway, here Stark tells Icarus to tell Cersei hello for him. Uh, Eternal Cersei, who has a fairly large role throughout Marvel history, being an Avenger for a while, as well as having a desire to live amongst humans, something referenced here when Sprite asks if she's collecting humans again, uh, Stark gets pissed and says he's not a collectible and asks who she is. Icarus tells him she's Sprite and that after a reboot, it's not uncommon for Eternals to change appearance. Shellhead replies he's never seen this before and Icarus tells him, huh, no, 
but it is common every 20 to 25,000 years or so. And he's interrupted by the machine screaming, excess deviation. Interestingly, both Eternals clutch their guts as if this notification causes physical pain. Stark, ever on the edge, sees the reaction and says, uh, you said you were fine. Is there a problem here? We get some of Gillen's humor with Sprite replying, yes, Icarus, no. Their facial expressions shift and then both say no. I love it. Stark takes his leave, saying Eternals got it eternal, and Sprite and Icarus enter the sewers. They have a good conversation again, designed to give a little backstory and context, with Sprite saying, wow, an Iron Man, a man made entirely of iron? Is this like the iron constructs of Hyboria? And Icarus cuts her off, I imagine gruffly. No, he's a human in a technological suit. There are many of these beings with names that have only the broadest relationship to their nature. Iron Man, Spider-Man, I believe there's even a man spider. They are not that any more than I am the mythological Icarus. You'll have missed that. Humans keep on mistaking us for gods for some reason. It annoys the gods enormously. Sprite says it's always strange coming back after a reboot with a mix of things you know, things you actually remember, and playing catch up on everything else. They see a faint red light ahead of them, and Sprite says to Icarus, at least I know how this goes. Even before I'd ever done it, I knew that. Again, the machine gives us what we need, the third principle, correct excess deviation. The deviants are the changing people. They are each a species of one. But statistically speaking, the average deviant weighs approximately 40 to 60 kilograms with the demeanor of a friendly puppy. And then sometimes they're not. This is our first look at a deviant so far. Uh, the Eternals and Deviants are mortal enemies. They've clashed for eons. Like a ranger class in D&D, the Eternals' favorite enemy is the deviant. The machine tells us with Icarus, it would be a fight. With Sprite, it would be a game. For both, it is simply what they have done for a million years. Time for some action. Icarus unleashes a concussive blast from his eyes, knocking the massive deviant on its ass. The machine compares deviants to mogwais after admitting it's unusually talkative again. It states, occasionally, the deviants spit out a gremlin that does awful things for awful reasons that make sense only to it. So, yes, deviants can be monsters, but... A deviant would likely mention that humans spit out serial killers. Icarus continues to trade blows with the huge creature, and the machine says, It is a good question. How do the worst of us define a species? Icarus knocks the thing out with a double-fisted uppercut. Sprite rambles about human medicine, and Icarus makes a note to the machine. Machine. Deviation note. It appeared to be attempting to extend life by feeding off human brain matter. Sprite says that's gross. They have an exchange about food, and Sprite says nothing has changed. Our narrator tells us, though, that Icarus is haunted. They have recently learned whatever use the Celestials had for them is over, and now they have no purpose. And still nothing has changed. They make a portal for teleportation and step through it to Olympia, their home city, which is located in an echo dimension. Here we're introduced, or reintroduced, depending on your knowledge of the Eternals, to Fastos. Fastos is often mistaken for the Greek god Hephaestus, the weapon maker and carries a hammer with the power to manipulate machinery. He does not welcome them, and instead says, It, 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 it's Zerus. And judging by Icarus's face, it's bad. Zerus is dead. Fastos tells Icarus the murder weapon. Five fingers pressing on his skull. Enormous power. The look on Sprite's face here is priceless. Fastos tells them, it must have happened shortly after he told you to free Sprite. Whoever it was arrived via the network and then escaped. Identity masked or lost. Sprite, not quite catching on, says, Hmm, if they used the displacement network, it'd have to have been an Eternal. So, what now? They're interrupted by an off-panel voice saying, We wait. Here the machine says, How to explain this one? Referring to the voice. Try this. Druig is revealed as the speaker. Icarus and Druig have a long history of enmity, and Machine says, If Icarus is an arrow, Druig is a snake. Druig speaks, saying, The Machine has no backlog of Eternals to resurrect. Zerus will be back shortly and tell us who murdered him. Either way, we should be making no more decisions until the Prime Eternal has returned. Icarus replies, There is an Eternal murderer on the loose, and you say, Wait? Druig and Icarus, having not seen each other in a while, have an exchange. Druig says, one would hope being eternal might teach you patience, but somehow it never happens. Icarus replies, you may have hoped me breaking your nose would grow boring, but somehow it never happens. Druig says Sprite is the prime suspect. She's like, wait, what? 
Icarus reminds her Zerus killed her when she nearly killed all the Eternals. That was back in the Gaiman series, which makes sense to her, all except the head-crushing hands. Druk agrees with her, grabbing Icarus's arm, inspecting his hands, saying, no, but the one who freed you has such pride in his power, plus little wit and nature that is easily manipulated, a suitable weapon, and is cut short by Icarus smashing his head into Druig's face, breaking his nose. Sprite and Icarus leave Druig, headed to a transporter. Sprite asks Icarus if he thinks she did it, and of course he knows better. She was with him the entire time. He asks the machine if any transit traces are left. The machine replies, yes, there's a distortion. Someone traveled the network who is unknown to me. Sprite asks the machine where the mysterious distortion went, and they are transported to Titanos. The caption reads, Titanos, fallen capital of the Eternals, superimposed between three seconds from now and two seconds ago. <laughs> Man, I love this sci-fi shit. And again, the artwork is off the chain. Ribic really excels at these otherworldly locations. Back to the story. Sprite believes if Icarus leaves her, she'll be put back in the exclusion until her name is cleared, and they agree to progress through Titanos with trepidation. Entering Titanos, it's clear that the place is blown to pieces, so the machine describes to us what happened. The previous Eternal Prime, Kronos, while attempting to master time, and again, that's the energy experiment that gave them all their superpowers, it set off explosions, killing the Eternals many times before they could stabilize it, and the machine itself almost perished. It goes on to say that time is both strong and weak in Titanos, with great eddies tearing it to shreds, both past and future visible in various places. Icarus sees himself at a tombstone, apologizing for failing. Sprite sees it too, and offers her condolences. Icarus tells her this event has not happened yet, but that he is going to live. And then, then, we see my favorite word balloon of all time. And even though it sometimes varies, it can only be one character. The balloon says, More eternal blasphemy. An affront against the universe. All that live must die. When I am done, there will be but a single thing that is eternal. Machine says, before the reveal, And how best to describe this one? Not the arrow, not the snake. It's Thanos, and he completes his sentence, death. And the machine says, oh, Thanos knows exactly who he is, to be continued. What a reveal. I love the art here, with Thanos towering over Icarus. It makes sense that he could travel the network being a mutated Eternal himself. And that concludes the first issue. So in conclusion, I loved it. That was a really strong first issue. Um, not surprising by the creative team. You know, Gillen and Ribic are both fantastic at their job. Um, Isad Ribic's art, especially the locations, the environments, that shit was off the chain. It was incredible. It was fun to look at. Um, Ribic's characters are fun to look at. The facial expressions, everything's there. All the beats are right. Um, the way the story moves along. I'm excited to see what's coming, especially more with Thanos. I love Thanos. He's ah, he's one of my favorites. I hope they use him correctly. That's my only thing. Like, I've read... I didn't like Thanos Rising. I don't remember who did it now. But, uh, yikes. This wasn't my Thanos. Um, and that's a thing. You know, that's a thing with comics. It's a thing with movies. It's it's a thing with everything. If, if it's something you love, you know? Especially a character, like a comic book character, that's never going to go away. They're never going to you know, be completely killed off unless you're Marvel, one of my other favorites that never comes back. This beer, however, this is really good. It is made by Victory and Six Point Brewery in Pennsylvania. It is damn good. I don't know what all this means. Uh, CTZ, Idaho 7, and Strata Hops. I tell you what, that shit kicks ass. I would definitely try this again. Um, so, basically, yes, I will continue to read The Eternals. Of course. Was that ever in question? Thank you guys for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the video. Check out our legendary deck building game video we just did. It's up on YouTube as well. Um, really fun game. We're going to do a playthrough here soon with uh, We Are Hayden. Uh, he's also tasked me to review Maximum Carnage, which... I'm not sure how I feel about that. I don't even know how I'm going to do it. It's 14 parts. I guess I'll have to just 
I don't know, maybe do it in sections. I don't know how else to do it. I don't know how to do it justice. If you guys have any suggestions at all, comics you want me to read, beers you want me to drink. I know Matt Humphrey had mentioned um, Giant Size X-Men 1 and I believe a Dale's Pale Ale. I'm down. Um, Sean, of course, Maximum Carnage. Um, James Dismore just asked me if I would read Venom the End. Of course I will. Why not? Sounds fun. It's the end of Venom. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Like, subscribe, do all the shit that everyone always asks you to do. Hang in there. Check it out. Hopefully you'll be back for more. Peace.